I'm here to talk about how we reason about procedural programs. Um, and I'm going to start by talking about, quote, how we reason about procedural programs, that is, about the title of the talk. Um, by programs here, I'm actually exaggerating. I'm not going to talk about whole programs today. Mostly, I'm going to talk about individual functions and how we know they work correctly. Um, more precisely, I'm going to talk about local reasoning, things that can be done entirely within the context of one translation unit, which limits the things you can prove, but does have a nice convenience factor. <laughs> um, reasoning. So there are definitely a lot of people who think it's really hard to do proofs about how programs work. This is false. We're actually really, really good about proving programs correct. I dare say anybody in this room has had the experience of looking at a function and saying, yes, I believe that function will work, or no, I don't believe that function will work. If you're doing that, what you are doing is constructing a proof that the function, trying to construct a proof that the function works in your head. We're not perfect at it, but we are really, really good at it. We routinely write functions that work. Um, you know, for comparison, a random number generator does not routinely write functions that work. So there must be a lot of functions, if we can just look at them and see the proof, where the proof is very close to the surface. And the, question, the, the first question is, can we have an algorithm for extracting that proof that is close to the surface? And when that doesn't work, can we have an algorithm, can we have hints that we can put into our program that will direct the algorithm to an actual proof? Um, and my contention, and I hope you'll agree with me by the end of the session, is that yes, we can put information into our programs that will direct an algorithm to a proof of the program. So we're going to start with simple programs and work our way up. Here's our first simple program. I hope you can read this size. Um, this, program, th this function, I should say function rather than program, this function is correct. And by correct, I mean that there is an execution path from the beginning of the function to the end of the function. And in fact, if we start at the beginning of the function here, we see we are at the end of the function. There is an execution path to the end of the function because we're already there. So that program's correct. We'll make it a little harder. <coughs> Here's a program that has a correctness condition written into it. This function is incorrect if the assertion fails. But we're going, to, we're going to prove that that doesn't happen, that there is always a path from the beginning of the function to the end of the function. And if that path crosses an assertion, that assertion will be true. Here we go. Whoops. Oh, yeah. Start at the beginning of the function. We ask, OK, we, have just re uh, we are right here in front of an assertion. Does this assertion look like it's true? Yeah, it does. OK, look at the next step. We step forward. The next step is here. We are now at the end of the function. We have a proof that from the end of the function, there is a, an execution path to the end of the function. We can then take that proof and go backward. Programs, like life, 
must be, un must be lived forward, but understood backward. If we back up, we can now say, any state at this execution path, any successor of this state has a path to the end of the function. Therefore, this state has a path to the end of the function. <coughs> and since that's the beginning, we're done. We have a proof that this is correct. Whoops, go forward. Next, oh, I'm going to use a special notation for that case. Instead of saying assert, I'm going to say claim. By claim, I mean something stronger than assert. Not just that this is going to be true, but that simply by examination of the program, it's going to be true. <coughs> so next function. A little more complicated now, we have a variable. Again, we start at the beginning of the function. We're going to, we come to a variable declaration. And what we do then is we're going to take this thing true and we're going to color it. We're going to color, put the same color on every place that true is said and every place that true is copied to by assignment <coughs> or copy construction throughout this program. So there we are. All the trues are, are blue now. We can now substitute into all the rest of the blue spaces. And we, say, and we look at this and say, look, when we reach this point, we're claiming something that is true. And then we reach the end of the function. Again, the proof is backward. From here, we have an execution path to the end. From here, the claim is true and any execution path goes to the end. From, whoops, from here, the su any successor of this will have an execution path to the end. Proof goes backwards. <coughs> a little more complicated now. Now we have a, a, a parameter. We're going to, when we have a parameter, we change our definition of correctness a little bit. We say, for every value, we're asking, it's correct if for every value of the parameter, this function is correct. So what do we do with, a, with the parameter? We color it. We've put blue on all of our, um, uh, on all of the places where this parameter or a copy of it is used. We step, we, we start at the beginning of the function. When we come to an if, we break into cases. Case one, the B is false. Case two, B is true. That is, whatever's in the if is true. We've already substituted that into the other blue places. So we can check each one of these individually, but for convenience, I'm going to just eliminate the dead code that we get because we know the answers to this if. So here, that function is going to be easy. This function, <coughs> we already know how to do it. So we get to the end of the function, we can build backwards. And in particular, whoops, when we build backwards from here, when we build backwards from here, whoa, one more. When we build backwards to here, this state had two successors. That's why we had to break into cases, because we had to show that every successor of this state will have a path to the end of the function that doesn't violate any claims. A question. So if your parameter was, say, 8-bit integer, would you have to split into 256 cases? No, you don't break into cases on parameters. You break into cases on if statements. Oh, the question is, if your parameter was, say, an 8-bit integer, would you have to break into 256 cases? And the answer is no. The breaking into cases is what you do when you come to an if statement, or in general, when you come to a branch. A little more complicated now. Here, 
there's actually two ways to get to that claim, and they work differently. But again, we start by coloring the, uh, our variable b. Here, we had to rearrange the program in order to color it. You can always do this. It can expand the program, but it doesn't blow it up into some infinite thing. <coughs> as long as you're coloring one variable at a time, you only have to unroll a little bit. Well, maybe you have to unroll some. <laughs> so, start at the first sequence point. I am going to rewrite that not into something a little easy, you know, so that I don't have to talk about identities of not. I'm just going to rewrite not as question mark false colon true. Um, now we see we've got a branch. Question mark is a branch. So break into cases. Now over here you see when we broke into the case, we already found out that claim was false. Um, in this one, we already found out that claim is true. So it's okay to get to this claim. It's not okay to get to that claim. Next step. Uh, whoop. Let's, I don't know what's going on with that slide. I think it substituted the conditional expression. Ah, yes, thank you. Next, yes, next step is an elimination of dead code. Because we know these things are false and true, respectively, we can eliminate the dead code and just come down to this. Um, now, we're again at a branch statement. We can, you know, we could color our trues and falses or something, but that's not important. We're just going to eliminate more dead code. And there, we've eliminated our dead code. Um, on that side, we step forward to, the, uh, to assignment to true. We step forward to claiming, you know, when we got that assignment, we found out <coughs> that claim was true. So we can walk past it, we can walk past this one, they're the same. Next program. Well, a little water, then the next program. Is it going all right for people? <clears throat> next program, a little more complicated. We have, an exp uh, we have a complex expression of our parameters. How are we going to get from eh, the fact that we did this complicated if thing and it was true to that claim was true? Well. I'm going to introduce the temporaries so that we can walk through a little bit more slowly. That code is basically this code. <laughs> I left out a few braces. The temporaries don't have quite the lifetime that they would in this. Um, so let's begin. <coughs> Color our parameters. Start at the first sequence point we come to this expression, a plus one. Well, we're actually going to have to color one first. And it shows up there and there. Then we color a plus one. Or we don't actually color a plus one. We color blue plus gray. So everything that is blue plus gray becomes <coughs> orange. By the way, my apologies to anybody out here who is colorblind. <laughs> The color is going to get, is kind of important. <laughs> I didn't know another way to do that. Also, apologies to anyone who is not colorblind. The colors are not always harmonious. <laughs> <laughs> so we have colored blue plus gray, orange. And we notice both T0 and T2 ended up colored the same way because we know they are going to hold the same value. <coughs> Come back. <coughs> mm -hmm. What if A had been modified in between there? How would you know not to color? Okay. The, the algorithm for coloring things in the future. Oh, repeating the question. What if A had been modified in between? And in fact, there was an example of that in the previous program. 
um, when you are coloring things in the future, when you come to a write into a variable, you say, ah, that's no longer the same thing. It's now whatever got written into there. So it's something you can follow. Um, more deeply, it does mean that once you are passing L values from function to function, you are going to have to be careful about which L values are equal to which other L values, uh, which, which L values have the same address as which other L values. Um, being careful about thing, things that are equal is a topic that we'll come to in a bit. Um, okay, so we've done this coloring. We can move on to... Um, okay, so addition is not an implicit branch in any of this. It is possible here, I didn't actually, in an earlier version of the slides that was unsigned, <laughs> um, I didn't actually put in the overflow checks that, you know, that would be necessary here. You know, if you are adding two numbers, there is an implicit precondition to addition of integers, but not unsigned integers, that the two numbers have a sum that is representable. Um, that I didn't actually write that into the examples that we are that use int here, and in fact, because I made no attempt to. Um, have a precondition that kept that from happening, this function should really be found incorrect for that reason. But I'm going to ignore that. Um, if they were unsigned, not a problem. Um, so, uh, let's see. Moving on to, whoops, yeah, here. We're going to do another expression. Uh, here it's orange less than green. We color it purple. I told you, color blindness might help you. Um, and then we move on. We come to an if statement. We break into cases. And look at this. Because these two were already colored purple, we've put true and false in the right places. We eliminate the dead code. And that side's going to be easy. I'm mostly going to talk about this side. Um, we don't have to color anything because this is already colored. We don't have to color anything there because it's already colored. We come to the claim, it's true, we can keep going. We come to the end of the program, and now we're on both branches at the end of the program. There's always a path from the last sequence point. Um, if you take all of it and run it all backwards, you've got a proof of the correctness modulo the overflow problem. Yes? Proof. So, oh, the question is, why do I have to go backwards? It seems like I've already proved it. It's kind of like I already proved it, but if you actually write down the math, the order in which you need to prove things is you start with the shortest thing first and work your, and work your way up. Um, so when I say you go ahead, need to go backward, really, yes, we have found our way, we're good. But to satisfy the mathematicians, to match the notion of formal proof that is out there, um, you would actually <laughs> write down the steps in the opposite order. So I do want to go back a little bit and talk about, whoops, yeah, here's a good spot. Um, I'm gonna talk about what's a color. A color represents a set of equations. Um, here, the color um, orange represents the fact that T0 is equal to T2 is equal to, a, is equal to A plus 1 as calculated at those various places. That is, 
if you walk forward, you, you can think of every variable calculated in the future as an expression written in terms of the variables you have here at the fist. And the color orange is saying all of those expressions are equal. Likewise, I should talk about what a slide means with all of these colors on it. Each slide is a mathematical statement. It's, it's saying for every, that is each slide that's in between sequence points. So let's <coughs> go forward with one. Um, the mathematical statement that this slide makes is that that is for every state whose sequence point is at the fist and which satisfies all the colored equations, there is an execution path to the end of the function that doesn't violate any claims. That's what a slide means. And so this sequence of slides is a sequence of mathematical statements, which flipped over, related to each other in a fairly simple way, is a proof. Next program. This is uh, kind of a real life one. It's a bit tricky though, because here I'm claiming A is equal to B, and we know it's going to be equal, they're going to be equal. But I'm not even mentioning doing that comparison until I get to that claim. How could it possibly be provable? Well, directly, you'd have a problem. So we're going to put in a hint. I'm going to posit as an axiom that either A is less than B, or A is equal to B, or A is greater than B. And this is a familiar axiom, we call it trichotomy. Um, and when we reach that point, when it's easy to calculate, we're just going to assume that that expression is true. So let's go. Color the parameters. We start here, we come to an if. Oops. Um, got the layering wrong here, but we color the expression in the if, and again, we see it's repeated. And again, we're not coloring the expression in the if. In fact, it's maybe a little clearer with the slide this way. We're coloring blue less than green. So anytime we see blue less than green, it would be orange. Break into cases. <coughs> True's over there, false is over here. Eliminate the dead code. The one on the left, that's easy. So I'm just going to concentrate on the one on the right. Again, you've come to an if statement. Color the thing in the if. Break into cases. Eliminate the dead code. One on the left, again, it's easy. So we ignore it. If you were actually coding the algorithm, you would not code it to say, ignore that. <laughs> um, so again, we've come to an expression. We're going to evaluate A is equal to B. We color it. Um, double bar or that's a branch. We break into cases. We eliminate the dead code. And here, eh, something kind of interesting has happened. On that <coughs> side, we are assuming that true is true, which is not terribly informative, but it's a nice place to be. On this side, we have posit false. That's not going to work. We are assuming that false is, that something is true when in fact it's false. So what we are assuming when we say posit <coughs> false is, this case never happens. Whoop. I guess I decided to look at the posit true claim true th bit there first. Over here, posit false, we just eliminate that case. And we're done. Next program. It gets a little harder. 
Um, in fact, it gets so hard that I put in a cert there. Why did I put in a cert? Anybody? Because this is not obviously true. We're going to have to add something in if we want that to be true. But let's give it a try anyway. Oop. It's not true. Okay, I take it back. I put in a cert here because I like copied from the wrong slide. <laughs> that one ought to be claim. And in fact, I'm going to expand it out again with the temporaries. I'm going to add, oh, okay. So I did decide I need to posit something. I'm positing two things here that are properties of equality. Um, here, I posit that if A is equal to B, then A is substitutable for B. That is, in expressions, using A and using B, using the value in A, using the value in B, would give you the same result. Here, I posit that A plus 1 is equal to A plus 1 because things should be equal to themselves. These are fine things to posit for scalar variables that are not floating point. Floating point, variables, floating point numbers have neither of these properties, which makes them really annoying. You would think floating point numbers should be equal to themselves or equals be substitutable. No, neither one. <laughs> um, but for integers, we're good, uh, apart from the overflow mentioned earlier. So let's begin. I got the layers wrong again. Uh, so we color A and B. Start at the beginning. We color the comparison between A and B. We come to the posit. We're going to assume that there is an execution path through this posit and <coughs> that it doesn't violate any assertions. And in particular, we are going to assume the substitutability when we get there. So, if statement, <coughs> color, uh, color green equal to blue, uh, blue equal to green, break into cases, eliminate the dead code. The code on the left is easy. Code on the right, substitutable. We are positing substitutability. What does that mean we do? we change the colors to be the same. If we'd been claiming substitutability, then we would check to see whether the colors are the same, and if the colors aren't the same, reject the program. But here, we're positing it, we turn them both red. Then we can step forward, we can color one, we can color red plus yellow, we can color purple equal purple, we come to a, we posit the light blue thing, therefore it must be true. Move on to the claim, we see the claim is true. Get to the end of the function, again, read it all backwards to turn it into a proof. From now on, I'm going to assume that these two properties, <coughs> the substitutability, and the reflexive property of equality are built in to equality of scalar types that are not floating point. So just whenever we come to equal and we decide that it's true, we're going to go ahead and turn them the same color. And whenever we come to equal between things of the same color that, you know, again, non-floating point scalars, we're going to say, yes, if they're the same color, they must be equal. So, next function. This one is a lot like the previous one. This is how I got mixed up. This one is a search because this one's trouble again. Even with our substitutions with the substitutability and the reflexive property, 
it's going to be trouble. Here's the program with all the temporaries written in. We start at the beginning, we color the parameters. <coughs> Up here, we color one, we color blue plus yellow, we go to the next statement, we color green plus yellow. I hope, uh, I, yeah, you've probably got it figured out that this is light green, that's dark green. <coughs> it looks clearer on here. <laughs> um, move on to the next statement. Color A equals B. Move on. Come to this posit. We break into cases, just like before. We're, we're going fine, just like before. Eliminate the dead code, and we come to the substitutability. Whoops. And the thing is, when we make those the same color, it's not going to change the color of these at all. That's a problem. It's actual actually a deep problem. Really, you want to go back and change the color of something back there, and then run forward again, and then you would find out that these were in fact equal. But if you do that, if you change the color of something in the past, you have to worry about things in the future of the past that have changed color, and you would interpret them differently now. And then you have to worry about things in the past of the future of the past, and what goes wrong then. <coughs> and you end up worrying about the past of the future of the past of the future of the past of the future of the past, and end up in a state that John Rhodes refers to as living in Woody Allen time, because it will make you neurotic. Really, it would be much nicer if we had just known up there to break into two cases depending on whether A was equal to B or not. If we'd done that, we'd be fine. So is there some bit of code we could put in that would suggest to us that we would break into cases? Anybody? No? Can we pull all posits all the way up? You can't if you try to pull them all the way up, you're going to get into this back and forth anyway, because which direction they substitute into each other becomes an issue. Um, so the ordering in which you say things is important. Could you move the A1 and B1 down past the initial posit since the A and B are not modified prior to that? Uh, yes, uh, you could do something like say, oh, the repeating question, could you move the addition up here past the posit? Now there was a branch in, in between, so we would have to say something up front like if A is equal to B, then we'll do the substitution. But we can be more direct about it. Uh, yes, there, I did the substitution, it didn't help down here. More directly, you can just put in a branch up there. Does nothing except force whoever is doing this coloring to break into cases as soon as they get to the branch. Once they've broken into cases, everything else is going to work. Different way to write that branch. Claim A is equal to B or A is not equal to B. <laughs> that might be a little familiar. <laughs> and this is what I would call a guiding claim. Sometimes you can just add in a few lines that make the proof go more smoothly. And that's sort of the lesson here. If you add in a few lines, you can just make the proof go smoothly. I'm going to point out that it's okay to rearrange things like this. As long as the claim is before the second edition, you're fine. I won't actually walk through and show it to you. You can take that as an exercise if you like. <sighs> so I see a few of the old hands are glazing over a little bit. Because this is the easy stuff. 
everybody knows it gets complicated when you come to loops. So let's have a loop. Here's a loop. The question is, is this correct? And that is, is there an execution path from the beginning to the end? If the loop runs forever, there is no execution path from the beginning to the end. So this program wouldn't be correct. Function wouldn't be correct. Um, <coughs> there's a bit of math involved in figuring out whether there's an execution path from the beginning to the end. In fact, this is the bit of math. I'm just going to say up front, 0 plus 1 plus 1 is 2. I feel confident in claiming that since it's an integral constant expression. Um, and with that in hand, we can start our coloring. We'll color 0. We will color 1. Color blue plus yellow green. We will color green plus yellow purple. Um, and you see, as we color it, we have to rearrange the code so that <coughs> things of different color end up on different branches. So as we're going through, we're sort of pushing that loop away from us and turning the things that are closer to us into branches. Next step, we will color two. Two's red, so the question is, Purple plus red. Okay, purple plus red is orange. And again, we have worked out that calculated 0 plus 1 plus 1 and compared it to 2. So we're good there. It's, we're claiming it, but it was an integral constant expression, so we are comfortable saying, yeah, that's true. But that puts the true in here. Whoops, so we can eliminate some dead code and move on. Now this program is pretty easy. It doesn't even have a loop in it anymore. <clears throat> How do you get rid of a loop? You calculate a bounding condition for it. You calculate enough possible exits that it could own, uh, enough possible exit conditions that it could only run finitely. Here, we just had to calculate that one off in the distance. You will notice that this proof is still going to be in three cases. There is a case where 0 is equal to 2, um, which we will check and we will say, yeah, we're good if 0 happens to be equal to 2. There's another case where 0 plus 1 is equal to 2, and we'll say, yeah, this function is good even if 0 plus 1 is equal to 2. And then there's our third case, where 0 plus 1 plus 1 definitely equal to true. We don't have any question about that one anymore. <sighs> Some people will think I cheated there. That was what's called a bounded loop. It never could have run more than two iterations. If you have a loop like this, it can run an arbitrary number of iterations. Ha! I've moved to unsigned. <laughs> Makes everything easier, except compiling the program. Um, OK, except optimizing the program. Uh, so here, this loop could run arbitrarily long. I can't stick a claim in front that's going to say, 0 plus 1 plus some more 1s is going to be equal to n, because it might take a long time to write that, and I would be wrong most of the time. So what can we do with an <coughs> unbounded loop like this? We can posit the unbounded loop exits. This is actually a mathematical axiom here. This is a fact about unsigned integers you can count from 0 to any unsigned integer. So, okay, 
we can posit that there exists an execution path through this loop. What can we prove once we have posited that there's an execution path through this loop? We can prove that there's an execution path through this loop. Now, it looks like just the same loop, but context counts. <coughs> this loop maybe you got stuck in because integers don't work the way that you thought they did. This loop you can't get stuck in even if in integers don't work the way you thought they did because you can't get to this loop unless that loop exits. Another way to look at it is this loop calculates a bounding condition for that loop. No. The, the question is, don't we need to prove the first loop in some fashion? By posit, I mean I'm taking it as axiomatic that there is a correct execution path through this loop. So we're just not going to prove it. We've given up. Um, or another way to look at it is that <coughs> we're taking, is that, yeah, that's one of the axioms of mathematics. You don't have to prove your axioms. <coughs> Another way to look at it, and perhaps the, a deeper way to look at it, is that posit is a quantifier. Claim is also a quantifier. Posit and claim are quantifiers over execution paths. The statement involved in this function is, for any execution path through this loop, there exists an execution path through that loop. Ah, uh, anything else before we move on? Because here's where it gets hairy. I'm going to make some room on the slide. And let's begin. We call our n. We come to the posit. We step into the posit and we color, um, we, we pick the color yellow for zero. Keep going. We compare yellow to green. There's orange is yellow equals green. We break into cases. Same old stuff. It's a little, the code around it's a little more complicated, but same old stuff. Um, we eliminate the, whoops. Ah, we break into cases. We saw that there was an equality on this side. We just decided that this, equal, this equality was true. Um, so in fact, we substitute down here that the equality is true. Did I get that in the wrong order? Um, so eliminate the dead code. It didn't really matter that we substituted down there because that went away. Um, we come, let's see, what are we going to do next? We're going to look at this one and say, this is boring. <laughs> you could prove that on your own. And this one, we're going to move back to the middle of the slide and rearrange the white space a little. Um, we come to the increment. Oh, there, we rearrange the white space. We color one. We color yellow plus blue, or yellow plus gray. Um, move forward, again, compare, break into cases, eliminate, whoops, do the substitution, eliminate the dead code, move back to the center, whoops, no, oh, ignore the one on the right that's easy, <laughs> there, that one, that one's the easy one, <coughs> so ignore that, move the interesting case back to the center, eliminate the white space, keep going. We color blue plus gray, light blue. I think you can probably see that light blue. We do the assignment. What does the assignment do? The assignment changes the color of I, so I went ahead and used dark blue for I anyway. Um, we step forward. This is getting repetitive. In fact, if we look back a few slides, Here's where we were just a few slides ago. Here's where we are now. 
<coughs> we're facing the same colors on the same code. And really, the, you know, the code here, if you map it back to the original source, same lines of code. Um, we're going to have to find some way to get out of this loop. So what do we do? We look at the iteration between the two. That is, what have we done between the two? Well, this is the old one. This is the new one. That is what we have done in between the two we're about to do, that we're about to do again. We're going to shift gears, and we're going to try to prove that that, that statement gives us this statement for any path that, you know, for any path through that the statement on the left, which turns into a mathematical statement, we're going to have for the same path through this one, it's true. That is, we're going to do, in, we've recognized a spot where we can do an implication. And we're going to move forward, trying to prove if the thing on the right works, the thing on the, uh, the thing on the left works, the thing on the right works. And I know that seems backwards. It's like we're assuming the thing we're trying to prove, but we're only doing it for particular path, one particular path at a time. And this is the essential confusion that comes with induction. You, prove it, you have to show that if it works for n, it works for n plus one. But I want to say it's not, you know, when I say it works for n, it works for n plus one, that's how you usually state induction. But that's not this n. The induction is on the path through the code, not on the variable. So the paths through the code can be laid, you know, if you have a cyc or if you have a cyclic graph, the paths through the graph are short paths plus loops added on. And the induction is over adding on loops. So here we are, we're going to show, after we've gotten to this point, one more is not going to hurt. But there's something a little different happening here. The match goes all the way to the end of the loop. So it's not just that we're going to see this one more time. We're going to see this forever. So imagine a whole sequence of programs running off to this side and out to infinity. They all start with this code, only the stuff down here is different. I'm going to represent that this way. I threw away all that gray stuff. We don't need it. Um, these two are related, one iteration and two iterations. They are related by the code in the bubble. I put a star next to it because we're going to repeat it an arbitrary number of times. And so from now on, we're only going to do things that work all the way out to infinity. <coughs> so let's continue. Oops. Uh, we come to this declaration. We don't have to color it. It's already colored. Uh, we come to this one. Oh, and I should say it was colored the same in both sides. Therefore, it was colored the same all the way out to infinity. Uh, this, however, isn't colored the same. So we have a bit of a problem. What can we do when we have a difference? We're not going all the way out to infinity again? Well, <coughs> we can throw away that. It's not going to do us any more good. We're going to start from this and think about all those things out to infinity. Well, we can calculate the next one by applying this code. Uh, I should warn you that variables here are allowed to color the code up there, which is a little tricky. Um, but there's only finitely ways, many ways to color it still. That's what makes this work, by the way. Because 
there are only finitely many ways to color the code, the algorithm always finds a match eventually. Um, so now we have the two iteration case, the three iteration case. We never actually proved that the program worked after two iterations, so we have to handle the it exited during that case also. Um, so the exiting after two iterations case, that's easy code. We're done. <laughs> um, the two iterations case and the three iteration case match. So we get to keep moving forward. We color, what, what was it? We, huh, seems like a, did I skip a slide? I must have skipped a slide. Um, so J, the color of J is purple. We've stepped forward over that. We've colored things purple down here. Um, and okay, again, they're not matching. What do we do? Throw that away. Calculate the three versus four. So inductions come in a number of varieties. The very simplest induction is, well, the first one works. After that, another one doesn't hurt. We're past that. For a while, we were looking at after the, f the first two work, and after that, another one doesn't hurt, never hurts. Now we're trying to prove after the first three, another one never hurts. I think I have seen some of you using induction in the bar. Um, and so after the first three, another one doesn't hurt. What happens there? Oh, that case was easy. That is that one down there. That's easy. Um, here we have another match. We go forward, we're getting into this same mess again, aren't we? Whoops, in fact, here's three iterations versus four. We're trying to prove after three, another one doesn't hurt. Here's the old one. After two, another one doesn't hurt. Those slides are very similar. Whoops, those slides are very similar. In fact, <coughs> there is this area that we've matched again this much. <clears throat> so here again, we can calculate what we had to go through to get from one to the other. And uh, apart from some dead code that always, that, that always fell out, we had to increment j. And again, it goes to the end of the loop. So we would be stuck doing this thing over and over forever, but that's exactly what we want when we're proving an, an implication like that. That is, we have shown that proving that if it works for three, for two, it works for three, is just the same as proving if it works for three, it works for four. And that's just the same as proving if it works for four, it works for five all the way out for, to infinity, all those implications are the same. And they never caused us any trouble. So we just get to skip to the end of the loop. And we will remember that j equals j plus 1 for any further inductions. We're now doing an induction on, well, if we checked another i to see if it was n, and if we checked, and if we incremented i, and you know, if it wasn't n, we incremented i, and if we incremented j to make everything match, would the, in, would the program still work? We've come to the end, so the program does still work, because the end of the program always works. And that is how you find the induction that's inherent in a program. Um, it doesn't always work. I told you that there's a big family of inductions. For this loop, there's always some number of special cases at the beginning, but it might not be after that another one never hurts. Sometimes, for the heavy drinkers, it's another double never hurts or another triple never hurts. 
there's a big family of inductions. This doesn't find all of those inductions. Um, and really, it's very hard to, because infinite set of inductions, it's multidimensional. But, and it gets worse if the thing that you're positing, if the code you've gone through before, has more complicated structure. Because really what you're doing is an induction over the loops that you have already accepted. So they might be very complicated loops. You know, it's induction over paths through a graph. Um, and they get complicated. Um, but the important thing is not that we have chosen the right induction for whatever the rest of the program is. I mean, that would be lovely, but that's not so important. What's important is that we have pro chosen an induction strong enough to prove a copy of what we had done before. And if we can do that, we can stick in some declaration, uh, we can stick in a guiding claim that will push things into any, other, into any wider induction. And the inductions have this nice property that, the, that if you go wider than necessary, you're still good. You know, <coughs> the small inductions prove less stuff than the inductions further out. So what can we put in here if, say, we want an induction on another double never hurts. Put in this little thing here. We're going to make two booleans, even and odd, start with even true and odd false. And we're going to write a loop here. This loop, maybe I should have written, written j equals j plus one, but um, this loop is just the same form of loop as that loop up there. Our, the way we found the induction, we'll find an induction that will work for this loop because it has the same form. Yes? What does the claim block mean? Haha. Yes, just like posit is a universal quantifier over execution paths, a claim is, is an existential quantifier over execution paths. Um, another way of, of looking at it is by claim, we are asserting that we will find, you know, that by inspection of the program, by finding that induction, we will find an execution path through this loop. I stuck it in a claim because you wouldn't actually want to run that code, not like if you want to go fast. You don't want to <coughs> stick an, an extra on loop in your code. So this is like an assertion. It's there to help the proof. It could also be there for helping testing. It probably, you know, this one doesn't help testing much, but it would try it. It's, you could run this code and see. Um, so yes, the claim there is mostly to say, yeah, this code is not really part of making the program do its thing, but instead is there just to guide the proof. So, oh, uh huh. The posit says that for all programs of this shape, there is an exit path for that program. Um, for, oh, the question is he's trying to clarify what posit means. Does it mean for all programs of this shape, there is an exit path through the, pro, uh, through the program? A little more than that. Um, it is once you have reached the posit, that, you know, that is, for every state that you could have reached to get to the posit, for all programs that are colored in the way they are when you reach the posit, um, there will be an ex, you know, for, and for, e yes, for every execution path through the posited code, the remainder of the program is correct. It gets a little bit more tricky when you put it in a loop. Um, I will throw out there the words Borel determinacy. Um, 
and the people who know what that's for. <laughs> um, oh well. Um, Borel determinacy is the theorem that says that doesn't make you crazy. I mean, it still makes it a little hard to work with, but um, it's a great theorem. Um, so here, what are we doing? We're taking these two variables. Ah, um, we're taking these two variables and we're flipping them back and forth. That gives us a natural two cycle in the coloring. I'm not actually going to show it, but as soon as we come down here to even and odd, this is going to expand into a two phase loop because in what, you know, in the even cases, the even, you know, even is going to be colored the color of true and odd is going to be colored the color of false. And in the odd cases, they'll be colored the other way around. So this will actually expand into a two phase loop when you get there. More generally, any expansion of a monoid, which is what you get when you try to unroll a, an execution graph, um, any expansion of a monoid can be represented by the monoid acting on a finite set. <laughs> um, so there is always a set of variables you can do like this. And you know, you sort of get the idea that, yes, label the kinds of states, push them around so that true is always in the correct spot. It'll be what you want. So, at the function scale, that's it. That's all there is to proving functions correct. You have to do four things. You have to posit the mathematical facts before you rely on them. Order counts. You have to mention equalities before they become important. You have to bound loops before entering them. And you have to un put those induction unrollers in before you come to a loop that has a crazy complex induction behind it. I should point out, those hardly ever happen. If you look at like all those, you know, all the basic algorithms in the STL, eh, at least all the linear ones, those are just, we posit reachability, that is, we posit a loop, or we take reachability as a precondition, which effectively posits for us, and we run a loop. Maybe we run two loops, but all of them are just, are just assume that one loop exits and prove that some identical loops exit with the little frills around the edges of the identical loops like that swap. <sighs> so that's, really all you have to do to prove your functions correct. And what was I going to say here? <laughs> um, yeah, I, oh. You're, you're, you're saying the proving the function is correct. You're just saying, meaning that it terminates in all cases. Uh, not that it terminates in all, oh, the question is, am I, by saying it's correct, am I saying it terminates in all cases? No, I'm not saying that's what you're proving. I'm saying that either it terminates or it fails a posit before it fails a claim. Um, because remember if like, zero plus one plus one had not been equal to two, we wouldn't have known that loop back there had terminated. So it's given the assumptions that you have posited, it's going to, it's going to terminate. Yes? Can you go all the way back to the first while loop slide? The first while loop slide. Well, let's, yeah, I'm gonna do it the hard way. Because you put the claim Yes. Why this did one. you put a claim and not a posit? Uh, okay. Bit of a judgment. Oh, the question is, why is that a claim and not a posit? Um, at some level, yes. 
mathematically it's a posit. Um, but here it's a question of, well, what does claim mean as a language feature when you use it with an integral constant expression? Um, I am willing to just say there is a rule that if the thing in the claim is an integral constant expression that evaluates to true, it's okay to claim it. And that basically keeps you from writing more posits into your programs than necessary. Because posits are dangerous. Posits are like axioms in your... Uh, yeah, but this is an axiom. Isn't that axiom about it, how it, it works? Well, yes, he says it's an axiom. It is an axiom about how addition works, but it is also verifiable by your proof system from whole cloth. I'm putting in a special rule. You get your constant expressions that evaluate to true for free. So no longer an axiom, it's just part of the proof system. Yes, doing loops is slower. But I will say that was a judgment call about how I want my proof system to work. Yes? Behavior, but then counting undefined behavior is the kind of thing I'm trying to prove doesn't happen. Yes. Um, okay. Um, yes, this is. Oh, the question is I prove that these things work as long as you haven't encountered any undefined behavior. Um, kind of the next level of working up from here is what are all of the preconditions of the basic C operations? Undefined behavior is always a precondition violation. Some undefined behavior can't, some of those preconditions can't be currently stated in the language. So, and this goes beyond the scope of what I'm doing today, but to get there, you have to put in ways to talk about whether, a ver whether an L value is readable or writable, for instance, which can't be said in the language <coughs> right now. Um, but once you've got that, you can say, okay, here in my function precondition, part of my precondition is this thing is readable and writable. And then when I read it and write it, it won't have, you know, I, I will be able to prove that that doesn't have undefined behavior. Other things like Division by zero, well, we're just going to say any time you say, you know, integer division, there's just an implicit claim happening right before that. The precondition of division is an implicit claim that that thing's not zero. And we'll reject a program if it hasn't given us reason to believe that number isn't zero. There's some work left for scaling this up. Um, so I would be remiss in not showing you like an actual proof of something a little complicated. Here's something that one might want to prove. If I can count from zero to n, then I can count from n <coughs> backward to zero. Not a very deep thing, but you can see this is going to require some sort of mathematical statement in between. It's not just calculating the same thing the same way both times. It's calculating paths through, to, through loops in different ways. So the question is, what goes in there? It did take me a little while to figure out what goes in there, but I think with a bit of practice, years and years from now, people might be able to say, this is what goes in there, of course. <laughs> um, the, the mathematical fact that you need to get from one loop to the other is that the predecessor of each number in that range, or sorry, the, the predecessor of the backwards numbers are equal to subtracting one from you know, that number. That is, this is, you know, this is our core fact, that the predecessor is s minus one. 
predecessor of s is s minus 1. Here is the definition of predecessor. You will note it's not doing s minus 1 to figure out the predecessor. It's counting up to s, and it's saying, what was the thing I counted just before? That's the predecessor. So this is sort of decrement the hard way, whereas s minus 1 is decrement the easy way. It's also necessary, it turns out, to posit these things in this order. One early attempt said I was going to do, well, first thing I need to know is that 0 plus 1 is equal to, you know, 0 plus 1 minus 1 is equal to 0. And then I would need 0 plus 1 plus 1 is e minus 1 is equal to 0 plus 1, and so forth. It turns out the substitution doesn't work. You do two cases, two, three cases of that. You walk through and, it says, and you find out you have not mentioned the equalities you need before you need them. But if you do it downward, if you start with the thing before n plus 1 minus 1 is equal to itself, and the thing before that plus 1 minus 1 is equal to itself, and so forth, you lay them out in just the order you need to show that that loop exits. So, to get this right, the reason you put this now in claim is just to say, well, this is just helper stuff. Yes. This is, again, I claim that there is an execution path through here. I don't really want to execute that execution path. Um, you could. And if you did, you would find out, oh, the question is, why did I put it in claim again? Um, I mean, he had the answer. But, um, but yes, you, it, doing this, you walk through, you have an execution path. If you executed it, you might find out that, no, you were wrong about arithmetic, because you can actually test this. You can run these loops. You can test this equality. You can actually check that your axioms work in the particular cases where you're using them. Um, you, can't, you can't ever check that they work in general, because that's what you would need a proof for. And by positing them, we have avoided proof. But you can check the particulars. So this is kind of a useful thing. I'm going to quickly blow it up into sort of the industrial version at a larger scale. This is a theorem. I've rearranged that same proof into not just one function, but a nice reusable function. Counting is reversible. We're going to claim this time a, it, a loop, the, that there is an execution path through this loop. This is a little different. Because of this word implementation here, Implementation is a notation for splitting a function into preconditions and postconditions. You run the preconditions, the caller is responsible for them. So while we're claiming it, it has to be proven. The caller, it's the caller's job to prove that. We come to the implementation. I say claim implementation because the implementation is a proof. It's not something you have to execute. But you might want to, just to make sure it's all working. And then the claim after the implementation is a, is a loop, is our conclusion. So we're going to have to prove that. And over here, we have, I've broken out our axiom into a function called up down. i plus 1 minus 1 is equal to i. Here, the implementation of counting is reversible. This is the body of the proof. So it's premise, conclusion, that function is a theorem. Implementation of a theorem is a proof. And to move this into a bit, of, a bit more real world context, we can talk templates. With this system, you can write reachable. It's just a loop. You can posit that, you can claim it, it's good. Reverse reachable, same thing, counting downward. That'll simplify the next slide. Here's our theorem and our proof. 
a template. It's not actually a theorem and a proof anymore. It's what mathematicians call a theorem schema and a proof schema. That is, it's a way, it's a pattern that we can turn into a proof of particular facts once we know what bidirectional iterator is. Um, so, our theorem, claim reachable, a precondition, <laughs> whoever calls reachability is reversible has to have already shown reachability. Claim implementation, there's going to be a proof. Claim reverse reachable, our conclusion is, yes, you can go the other way around for a bidirectional iterator. And then here is the proof. It's the same as before. I'm using this function up, down, on. Okay, I changed this predecessor of end because I have to actually count from B up to S and then take the previous thing. And let's see. In fact, there it is. Predecessor of end is just doing the same thing we did for integers for iterators. And then here is up, <coughs> down. Um, this is a property you want to be true of every bidirectional iterator, that if you increment it and then you decrement it, and assuming that because it's in the precondition, those operations were avail uh, you know, didn't have undefined behavior, um, we have a proof that um, the two, that you, you're back to your original value, or that it compares equal, and I'm not going to fill in the proof. This is just something you could specialize if you need a proof. If, you, if the empty proof works, and often the empty proof does work, you could just take the default specialization. And that's all. Questions? <laughs> Sorry, I'm... Sorry, do you have a, a way of proving one bit of code is okay and then using that proof as a sort of subroutine you'd like to prove is if that uses the same code in a different context is also okay? You can really use subproofs if you like. Yes. Um, so, like I said, you need a mechanism in the language to scale. Oh, the question is, is there a way to reuse proofs? And so, let's go back. So, here is a proof. The theorem here, so the proof here, this <coughs> function, this goes off, this can go off on a CP file. Check it once you're done, you've proved that. The theorem, I made it inline. Inline is kind of important. I'm treating inline in a special logical way. But it goes in a head, the theorem goes in a header file. So anybody who wants to can call counting is reversible. And when they call it, we're, go we're going to make them prove that you can count up to n. But once they've done that, we can just assume that you can count down from n because we know the proof is out there. <sighs> so this is separate compilation for proofs. Yes? So do you have like, an implementation that I could try this? Uh, no, really not. Okay. Um, you know, I have toy implementation. Oh, the question is, do I have an implementation? You can try it. I have toy implementations that work on assembly, on a very limited assembly-like language. You know, compare for equal increment. Um, and, you know, honestly, they are really pretty grungy. But, um, you know, got to get out there somehow. <laughs> um, yes? Well, it's interesting because the way I think about contracts is a little bit different than this. This is saying basically if the program doesn't satisfy this, it's broken no matter what it's trying to do. So it has to, that, that's absolutely. But even if this does pass, uh, it doesn't mean that the program is doing what you asked it to do. It means it's doing something reasonable. Now, the, the case where you said you used int versus unsigned is kind of a point where a narrow contract gives you more opportunity to check unconditionally. If you use unsigned, you're kind of masking the problem because if I subtract two unsigned, say small unsigned, and I get four billion, that's not the number I wanted. At least with the int, 
you know, if I if I do something, I'll get, you know, I'll get the right answer. Now maybe I'll go off the end, but then that's something you can check as well. So mm -hmm. your thoughts on that? Okay, there? so the question is quite complicated, but I'm going to try and summarize. We, the the question is, um, yes, this shows that. <coughs> Uh, you get through functions if your posits are all okay, and it shows that the things you claim are in fact true. It doesn't show that the program works the way you want. And yes, that is a very valid criticism, limitation. Um, if you put in more claims that say more about what you want your program to do, then you will have greater confidence that it does what you want. But there is, you know, a fundamental issue. You, you know, get it out into the field and what your program did not do was satisfy the customer. Yeah, that's hard to claim. <laughs> but this is good for avoiding undefined behavior, especially if we put into all of the basic operations and all of the library functions um, proper uh, expressions of their preconditions. Yes? So the, the coloring mechanism for uh, working through these proofs mm -hmm. is based on copying and equaling. How does that, how does that work with the, in the context of user-defined types? I'm sure that we have to impose some, some rules about the definition of those operators for the, or classes to make that work in this context. Uh, okay, the question is, the coloring um, is basically a um, representation of the, re of the relationship of substitutability. I know I, mentioned, I said earlier equality. It's, it's mathematical equality, which really is substitutability. It's not double equals equality, which some types might define differently. Um, and really, we only have that commerce between substitutability and equality when we are using scalar types that are not floating point. Um, the beyond that, well, A, actual user-defined types are made up of scalar types. When you get down to the bottom of them, they are all scalar types. So we will be saying things, you know, when we say something about a user-defined type, we are saying things about scalar variables. Um, that's sometimes a bit of a cumbersome way to work. It's certainly going to be true that it is worthwhile for, I think, for user-defined types to publish in their interfaces that say, if you know my equality operator returns true, these two things are substitutable for each other, and we need a definition of how does that push down into substitutability of members and so forth. That's part of scaling this up to user-defined types, which is, you know, definitely another talk. <laughs> ah, next, anybody? Yes. Um, going back to the presentation title and your introduction. Um, do you think this is a good representation of what we, as developers, actually do to reason about the program? Um, it's imperfect. Oh, the question is, is, do I think this is a good representation of what developers think about when they reason about a program? Um, it certainly starts from considering um, how people think about their program, the, the coloring business. You know, that really, I focused on that because I thought, yeah, color, the coloring business does kind of represent how I think about programs when I'm walking through the code. The fact that the, the, <coughs> the walking through is always forward. It's very easy to make proof systems where you're back and forth and back and forth. Um, and, but you don't really think of programs that way, or if you do, you get a little confused each time you have to swap. So I decided that, yes, I wanted a proof system 
that worked entirely by forward reasoning. Um, induction, induction is maybe not quite how um, programmers think about their code, but they're definitely thinking about, I know I can do this loop. I'm going to write a variation on this loop and it'll still work. And the induction under the, uh, under the covers he can, can be pretty much under the covers there. If what you are thinking of is I do this loop and a variation on it will work. For example, if I do reachability, but I want to show that find works, that the loop in, in a find exits. Reachability bounds the loop in the find. And that's maybe the more straightforward way to think about it instead of going back to how the mathematicians do, which is induction. Anything else? Um, the question is, how would I deal with global state that the function promises not to, to modify or not modify? That is a large scale problem for another talk. <laughs> um, I've got an idea, but global, global state and proving that recursions don't exit, you really, you know, the best I've got for those seems to depend on having a module system that enforces well-ordered layering between modules and we don't have that. And for, for the recursion, I'm not sure you, I'm not quite sure how you get there anyway. Um, so those are deeper problems. This only shows a local kind of correctness. Um, globals make your program harder to reason about. You need larger scale reasoning. So I'm not seeing a lot of hands up, but I know you had a question. No, you. <laughs> You're not going to ask it? <laughs> uh, remind me what I was supposed to ask. Uh, <laughs> he, oh, I, I'll ask. I was ask. Gonna ask one for him. You had said that it's the mathematical kind of equality which substitutability. But I always, Kevin Henney taught me this six years ago, substitutability with respect to what? Because substitutability... Uh has to be with respect to something. Okay, the question is, uh, when I say I'm talking about the substitutability of, you know, instead of math, as math mathematical equality is substitutability. Um, the question is, substitutability with respect to what? And the answer is substitutability with respect to every mathematical term or predicate. Um, so in effect, when I say integers are substitutability, that means all the operations on integers will have the same, uh, will give you the same result and the same success, depend, you know, whether or not, with, you know, if you use either one of those equal values. Uh, no, um, the question, uh, the point is, mathematical operations are not the same as address of. Um, yes, L values are their own problem. They're solvable. L values aren't so hard, but address of, taking the address of a variable is not something where substitutability works because substitutability is about the values. Um, so if Variable A has a value that is the same as variable v, B. When we take the address, we don't necessarily get the same address. Yes? So what sort of tools out there will facilitate this mathematical reasoning about, uh, about functions and or you know, do parts of it or verify that what you have you know, reasoned about is correct? Yes. OK. The question is, what sort of tools are out there that will do this sort of reasoning on your programs and help you get through it? Uh, I'm going to make the slide deck available. Uh, <laughs> that's, this is early days. Yes? Can, can all posits can be represented as a constant? 
No, definitely not. The question is, can all posits be, ex uh, can, be can all posits be represented as a const expr? Um, it's not actually a good idea to like modify things and um, you know return values or something out of your claims and posits. Um, that has some issues, and there's larger scale uh, questions of what do you want to prove about them. But definitely, um, these are active code. When I posit something, or when I claim something, the, their equivalent, um, you know, here I'm making an assumption. But the assumption very much depends on what, what um, number was passed in there. So it's something that can't be validated until we get that, you know, it can be proven, perhaps, but it can't actually be tested until we have a value for n. And looks like I'm at time, so you'll have to ask your question after we shut everything off. <laughs>